yeah absolutely yeah uh, dr p v shiva our hyderabad city president is here sir ah uh, namaskar shiva <laughs> unmute unmute sir unmute i think you let me put the request of connection unmute ah yeah yeah jai <laughs> shankar ji good evening good evening namaste namaste good evening sir namaste hi hi good evening good evening good evening hi. i am i am in a evening walk i'll shortly join you very good very good you already joined no you already joined yeah, yeah i am walking <laughs> yeah yeah सर सात ये दम हैलंगाना वेबिनार दिस इज फिफ्टीन वेबिनार फॉर दिस इयर टू थवेंटी टू बीन रनिंग इट कंटिन्यूसली इन स्पाइट ऑफ लॉट ऑफ यू नो डिस्टर्बेंस So hopefully it will continue. Uh, today our speaker is Dr. Jay Shankar Jana. Uh, he is from Pune. Uh, thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so today's uh, co- this uh, coordinator is uh, Dr. Aditya Vikram. Uh, over to Aditya. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good evening, one and all. Respected President, sir. All the senior professors, senior faculty, and all the colleagues and the postgraduates. so today we have a very interesting topic uh, we have a topic for a, a patient with a transplant coming for a non transplant surgery so we have a speaker from maharashtra dr joy shankar j jana he is a very senior consultant who has been practicing at km hospital mumbai as well as at galaxy care hospital pune he has multiple publications attached to him he has four international as well as two national publications and the special areas of interest are the anesthesia for robotic surgeries and uh, anesthesia for cochlear implant anesthesia for multiple organs in uh, transplant that is kidney liver and also uh, he has been holding several high dignitary position in uh, at the isa office at multiple levels he has been the governing council member for isa national from 2016 to 19 He has been the governing council member for ISA Maharashtra from 2012 to 16. He has been the honorable secretary as well as president for the Pune city, and he is the first in India and Asia. He has done anesthesia for uterine transplant as well as anesthesia for a cesarean section after uterine transplant. So I I think no one else other than him can justify this topic, and I think everyone will be eagerly awaiting to get a glimpse of this special situations as we all know. with the recent advances in the medical things now transplant patient coming for non transplant surgery will become a much more routine than anticipated and expected so as an as a practicing pt or a consultant we all need to know what are the care that we need to take in such special situation so without wasting further time i would request dr joy shankar sir to start this session <laughs> बशीर सबको म्यूट कर देना बशीर सर जस्ट अ सेक या 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 यस सर प्लीज सर thank you so much aditya for your for the kind introduction and i thank ias telangana uh, our president of ias telangana professor virishan sir the honorary secretary rama krishna reddy sir and all the office bearers and the senior faculty members and the delegates who have joined in and the pg students this topic is uh, quite a rare thing but it is a upcoming thing and uh, everybody should know how to manage such patients as you know india is uh, developing uh, multiple uh, transplant centers all over india especially in the southern part maybe around hyderabad you know there are so many transplant centers coming up every day every week so the number of transplanted patients are uh, uh, coming for surgery is also going up and the number of transplant patients on even suppression drugs are also going up now the com- commonly so this is the topic uh, of today 
So the commonly transplant surgeries which are done in India are kidney, liver, heart, lung, pancreas, small intestine, uterus, and of course the limb and the face. Now all these transplant patients who may come from small villages or district places may not be able to come for surgeries other than transplant to the transplant centers. So the most commonly done non-transplant surgeries in the transplanted patient on immunosuppression drugs are obstructed hernia, intestinal obstruction. If there is a road traffic accident, fracture of the bones or hip joint and um, head injuries, lymph node biopsies, uh, abscess drainage, most common. And of course, in pregnant ladies, uh, MTPs, DNEs, liver analysis, and even uh, scissor sections. So all the transplant patients who are on immunosuppression drugs, uh, we should know the interaction with the various uh, drugs which we use in the perioperative period. So these immunosuppression drugs have significantly changed over the year of time. When, when we were in, the, you know, in our PG days, these uh, immunosuppression drugs were very rudimentary. Now over the last so many years, it has become more fine and um, more with limited side effects. So if you see the current uh, immunosuppression drugs, this is a very busy slide. You can see the various types of immunosuppression drugs which are used. I'll just summarize this. So the commonly used drugs is calcineurin inhibitors, that is tractolimus, uh, antimetabolites like uh, mycophilolate moftil or an azithioprine, and of course, corticosteroids, most commonly uses prednisolone. Now, these all these drugs uh, are very, very nice and good drugs, but they have a very narrow uh, therapeutic margin. So if the doses go higher, that is super therapeutic levels, you can see all the side effects of the drugs. Whereas if they go intra-therapeutic, that means they can get, they can lead to graft rejection. So we have a very narrow margin and you have to maintain the therapeutic levels. So routinely we monitor the serum tractolimus level and the normal levels we maintain is between five to 15 nanograms per ml. We'll see the side effects. So these are the various side effects of the various drugs. Uh, if you see that uh, list uh, on the tactolimus level side, you can get hypertension, diabetes, neurotoxicity, and renal insufficiency. Whereas uh, uh, mycophilonate will cause hypertension, diabetes, and neurotoxicity. And of course, steroids will can cause anemia and leukopenia. Various drugs are used uh, during the perioperative period, right from uh, pre-medication, antibiotics, antifungals, everything, you know, uh, opioids, and of course, anesthesia drugs. So these drugs have an interaction with the immunosuppression drugs, and these can cause a rise in the serum tactolimus level or a decrease in the serum tactolimus level. So you have to know what are the interactions of the various drugs. So these are the various uh, perioperative drugs, right from benzodiazepines, antibiotics, antifungals, uh, anticoagulants, oral hypoglycemics, uh, antihypertensives and of course anesthesia drugs. The, I will discuss the anesthesia part a little later. So which drugs will increase the serum tactolimus levels? So these are the various drugs which will increase the serum tactolimus levels. Antibiotics like erythromycin, levofloxx, metronidazole, and fluconazole, amadolon, amlodipin, niltezine, oral antihypoglycemic drugs, ranitidine, metoprobamide, and of course any CID group of drugs which can also lead to renal function. The interactions with anesthetic drugs, I will uh, discuss it later when we are discussing anesthesia part. So when we get a transplanted patient on immunosuppression drugs, how do we assess the patient and we can give a good perioperative care? So the perioperative goals are uh, very much similar to that of a standard care. But the points to remember is that the transplanted organ has no nerve supply. So it is a denervated organ. Immunosuppression drug, drugs also affects the other organs. The most commonly affected organs are kidney, bone marrow, and CNS. Immunosuppression drugs should not or cannot be stopped during the perioperative period. You have to maintain the graft function. So you have to monitor for adequate organ proficient pressure and monitor for graft re uh, rejection during the perioperative period. Of course, these, these patients are very high risk for infection. It could be bacterial, viral, fungal, or even protozoal infection. So strict or septic precautions have to be maintained throughout the perioperative period. And of course, these patients are uh, at the high risk for developing deep vein thrombosis. So prophylaxis for deep vein thrombosis should be given for all these transplanted patients. So uh, as you see, you see the patient, first is the history taking. In the history taking, in the perioperative assessment part, type of organ transplant, whether it is a kidney, liver, whatever type of organ transplant the patient has undergone, the place where the uh, organ transplant has happened, the date since the organ transplant has happened. If you can get the address of the uh, hospital where the transplant has happened, uh, email or phone number or the anesthesiologist name, 
So this is equally important to get all the information regarding where the transplant has happened, the address, and the uh, contact numbers. Then the duration since the transplant has happened, how many years ago or how many months ago the transplant has happened, and when was the last follow-up the transplanted patient had with the transplant team. So this gives us a rough idea how is the graft functioning. Because all these immunosuppression drugs uh, will uh, cause multiple medical problems can lead to coexisting diseases like hypertension, diabetes, renal dysfunction, epilepsy, bone marrow depression, lymphoproliferative disease, adrenal insufficiency, peptic ulcers, and of course, venous embolism. Then comes to the physical examination part. So in the physical examination, how do you evaluate it? Besides the routine evaluation, you must evaluate it for the graft function. How is the graft functioning? Presence of any infection, function of the other organs, rest of the other organs of the body, and evaluation of the concomitant diseases because of the immunosuppression drugs or if the patient has a concurrent medical problem. So in physical examination, if there is weight gain, edema, dyspnea, sweating, malaise, rash, fever, abdominal pain, abdominal breath sounds, on auscultation and change in the urine and stool output, that these are the signs or the, these are the potential signs of infection or rejection. In the investigation part, a complete blood count with the blood sugar and HbA1c with routine and urine. Renal function test, including semi-nucleides, liver function test up to the complete corruption profile, biomarkers, image, imaging, X-ray test, 2D echo, ECG. <coughs> And miscellaneous like stress test, dovitamine stress test, PFT, spirometry, including USG, MRI, and CT. So after that comes the pre-medication, how to prepare the patient. It's a standard pre-medication, but some dose adjustment has to be required. So always stress on uh, prevention of stress ulcers and uh, deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis. Now benzodiazepines, these benzodiazepines which we give for anxiolytics has to be given in the half the dose because the benzodiazepine dose will go up with the patients on immunosuppression. So you have to decrease the dose of benzodiazepine. Broad spectrum antibiotic. This is a must, should be administered about one hour before the surgical incision. And uh, these are the various, what, so what are the various guidelines for giving antibiotics in the transplanted patients? So these are the various uh, guidelines for antibiotic prophylaxis, say for cardiothoracic surgery, vascular surgery, colonic surgery, hip uh, uh, knee replacement, and of course, cystectomy, whether vaginal or abdominal. So if you take a summary of all the antibiotics, it is the uh, IV cefuroxam is the safest. So it has to be given and uh, about one hour before the surgical incisions. All medications for the co coexisting diseases uh, should be continued like diabetes, hypertension, IHD. Supplemental, if the patient is on long-term steroids or supplemental steroids should be added uh, to prevent the stress of uh, steroids. And the dose of the immunosuppression should be given to maintain the therapeutic level. It can be given about four to six hours before surgery orally with one sip of water. Now the anesthetic technique, which is coming up. So uh, standard anesthesia care, general anesthesia can be given, neuroaxial blockade, nerve blockade, uh, regional anesthesia can be given. The important points to remember are that, just hold on. The important points to note, note here is that uh, the organ is a denervated organ, so it doesn't have the autonomic balance. So if you see the drugs, drugs like thiopentone, propofol, etomidine, local anesthetic like bupivacaine and rupivacaine can safely be used. There is an increase in the effects of benzodiazepines and the opioids. So you have to maintain the dose so that the excess dose doesn't happen. It is also there is an increase in the duration of muscle relaxants. But if you use this atracarium or atracarium, it is much better. And uh, neuroaxial blockade, uh, regional anesthesia can be safely given depending upon the coagulation status of the patient. And the autonomic pre existing autonomic uh, neuropathy. So, there is a severely diabetic, if they can have autonomic neuropathy. So, you have to judge as per the patient. Now, some uh, points regarding the airway. So, these patients on immunosuppression, they have a neck joint immobility. They have a lymphoproliferative growth, which compromises the airway and intubation. There's always a risk of aspiration due to delayed gastric emptying time because of the drugs. So, rapid sequence intubation is preferred. So always prefer a oral intubation over a nasal because if you do a nasal intubation, all the flora of the node will go into the trachea. LMA can be uh, is much much uh, acceptable depending upon the type of surgery and the duration of surgery. Avoid hyperventilation because this uh, decreases the stridual threshold. So you have to maintain a normal capillary ventilation and of course early extubation as far as possible is preferable. Intra monitoring standard uh, monitoring as per ISA guidelines. 
uh, but for major surgeries with multiple medical problems and expected blood loss, you can go for invasive hemodynamic monitoring, neuromuscular monitoring, and temperature monitoring. Post-operative care, uh, better to shift such patients on immunosuppression drugs to a separate isolation room. I mean, if, if the, uh, there's a separate room uh, which can the patient can be kept in a post-operative period, whether it's a room or high dependency unit or even the ICU, better to shift in the isolation area. Standard post-operative pain, pain management, operate sparing local anesthetic blocks, avoid NSAID group of drugs because all of them are necessary. Early uh, ambulation, immunosuppression drugs should be continued and recommended monitoring of uh, serum tacrolimus level in the perioperative unit. Now some specific anesthesia uh, consideration. Suppose a patient has had a kidney transplant. So how will you manage or how, what should be your lookout? So kidney transplant patients, they usually have a high incidence of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. So chronic graft rejection can be there if there is azotemia, proteinemia, and hypertension. So intraoperatively, you have to maintain a good renal perfusion pressure adequate intravascular volume, avoid all the nephrotoxic drugs and monitor of serum potassium levels. If the patient has undergone a liver transplant, so if the liver transplant function or the liver uh, functions and the renal functions are normal, standard care, coagulation profile is normal, no point, uh, no problem in giving visual anesthesia techniques. Only thing is that you have to maintain uh, or avoid hemoconcentration. So uh, you should maintain the hematocrit around 28. This is to avoid the thrombosis of the hepatic artery because the anastomosis of the hepatic artery. So you have to prevent that uh, from also. You have to maintain the hematic rate um, a little higher. So avoid hemoconcentration. If the patient has undergone a pancreatic transplant, so because of the pancreatic problems, they have a persistent complication of diabetes like gastropathy and neuropathy, which will continue even after the transplant. For pancreas graph rejection, how to monitor serum amylase level and urine amylase level. And strict perioperative management of, of course, glucose and acidics should be maintained. Now, if the patient has undergone a cardiac transplant, a heart transplant, so what are the things? So that is, this is the most complicated part. One must remember this transplanted heart is a completely denervated heart. So it lacks the neural So no sympathetic and parasympathetic regulation of the heart. The resting ECG will have two P waves. That is one of the recipient's P wave and one of the donor heart P wave. Cardiac output is dependent more on the venous status, so preload dependent, so maintain sufficient systolic pressure and prevent hypovolemia. Catecholamine receptors on the donor heart is intact. There is no neural uh, autoregulation, but the catecholamine receptors inside the donor heart is intact. So it will act. So all the drugs which directly act on the catecholamine receptors can be used like say adrenaline, noradrenaline, isoprenaline, and dobutamine. Then atropine has no effect on the donor heart. So it cannot be used for treating bradycardia. So while giving the vessel, you have to be very careful while giving uh, the new treatment because it can cause to severe bradycardia. So, so these are the various drugs uh, which directly act on the donor receptor of the heart. I've already said dobutamine, uh, dopamine, and all those. The other drugs are milidone and rivocibenda. Then uh, preoperative evaluation, of course, ECG, stress test, dobutamine stress test if the patient is not able to walk on the treadmill. 2D echo, if the 2D echo shows severe systolic and diastolic dysfunction, this indicates there is a rejection of the heart. Coronary angiography, depending upon the type of case. And of course, if there's a pacemaker, you have to know the proper functioning of the pacemaker. So testing of the pacemaker. General anesthesia is always preferred along with invasive monitoring, along with monitoring with uh, transesophageal echocardiography. So such patients, if you get, if it is a real emergency, you can do it in a small nursing home or a small corporate hospital, but it is better to shift in a tertiary care hospital where you have the backup of cardiac monitoring and cardiac, everything cardiac, and you can go in for major surgeries and also it's better to shift such heart transplant patients to eye center. But if it is an emergency, this is how you go about it. Now, if the patient has undergone a lung transplant, this denervated lung is also uh, uh, lacks the uh, cough reflex, so especially below the tracheal anastomosis. So the trachea of the transplanted lung is anastomosis. Below that level, there is absence of cough reflex. So they are prone for uh, retention of secretions and silent aspirations. There's an increase in the interstitial fluid uh, accumulation because the lymphatics are gone. So interstitial fluid will accumulate because of the altered lymphatic drainage. Preoperatively, of course, the exercise is spirometry. Regional exercise is preferred if there is no contraindication. 
If you have to give GA, then invasive monitoring may be required. Now, some special conditions which may uh, you can en encounter in our uh, routine practice because this number of transplanted patient is going on. You will definitely get in your uh, span of uh, practice one or two, at least, or maybe more. I have faced about five to six post transplant patients on uh, immunosuppression drugs. So, how to manage it? The most common thing you will face is pregnancy. So, all post transplanted patients should be referred as a high risk obstetrics. All the uh, immunosuppression drugs are not tailored to the baby, but it causes all the side effects to the pregnant lady. So, there can be hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia. <coughs> Diabetes, nephropathy, neuropathy, there can be premature delivery or even low birth weight. Standard care, that of any other transplant patient, neuroaxial block, and uh, is preferred if there is no contraindication. The other common uh, problem uh, surgery will face is trauma, road traffic accident, head injury, or fall in the house. So, uh, these patients who are transplanted and on, on immunosuppression drugs have a low bone density. So there's poor bone healing. So they're more prone for hip fractures and compression vertebral fractures. Standard care, nothing more different. But only thing is that bone infection should never. So antibiotic should be given very meticulously and as per the guidelines. And you have to maintain strict or septic precautions to prevent any bone infection. Other thing you commonly face is acute cholecystitis, acute appendicitis, or twisted overhead mass. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy, appendicectomy. All lab procedures are safe uh, because they have a short hospital stay. They return early to pre-operative conditions. And of course, standard care depending upon the type of surgery. So at the end, a systematic, rational, and scientific approach to such patients, you can definitely manage uh, such patients uh, because as the number of transplant, as I said, is going up across India, local anesthesia, regional anesthesia, general anesthesia can safely be given with a successful perioperative management. Immunosuppression drugs should not be stopped during the perioperative period. So you have to get familiar with the various side effects and adverse effects and the drug interactions. Where if you have such patients, immediately you uh, do a Google search, you get all the information. And this is a huge lecture. If this, if there can be a textbook. I've condensed it to hardly 20, 25 minutes. So I could not cover the depth of the lecture. And of course, the second anesthesiologist trend and interaction with the transplant team will definitely decrease your apprehensions and tensions. So at the end, let's pledge the biggest donation is not money, property or fame, but organ donation. Organ donation will not only save life, but also can give birth to a new life. Thank you, sir, for a patient listening. Thank you so much, sir. That was a very concise and to the point presentation. As we have been discussing, like sir has been mentioning in the talk also, every one of us whether intentionally or unintentionally, we'll be facing a transplant patient coming for a non-transplant surgery. So it's better to know the basics at least if you're not in a tertiary setup, at least what to do in emergency. Like they say, do not do further harm to the patient. Yes. So thank you so much, sir. That was quite a concise and well-directed lecture. So if there are any doubts, we can entertain, uh, allow one or two questions and then we move on to the next part of the see uh, the teaching the program yes bashir ek bar sabko unmute kar dena so theek hai sir i would request you to please oh, yeah i'll ask you online i'll ask you online so if there are any any questions coming in the chat box probably after the case discussion we'll have a discussion yes yes, yes thank you aditya thank you thank you sir so mm -hmm. since there are no questions coming we'll move on to the next thing uh, the next thing is a case discussion uh, as we have been starting the last time onwards so today the case discussion is on the burns case so uh, there are two very uh, known persons who requires no further introduction itself uh, we have our uh, honorable president uh, dr veeresham sir as well as dr hemnath babu sir who is a professor of anesthesia at the gems hospital shrikakulam so either of them do not need any further introduction so we have a case presentation i would request uh, pg's dr navya and dr ramya chitra to start the case presentation please Dr. Ramya and Dr. Navya. Please start the presentation. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Uh, 
this is dr ramya yeah right so you are audible please start the case presentation good evening respected professors uh, i am dr ramya chitra third year uh, uh, postgraduate in anesthesiology at great eastern medical school hospital shikakulam this is my colleague dr navya finally postgraduate uh, our moderator sir dr vireesham sir uh, professor dr himnath babu sir uh, professor at great eastern medical school and hospital shikakulam uh, we will be presenting uh, a case regarding anesthetic management of postpartum contracture so um, we had a 35 year old male patient by name brahma rao who is a daily wage laborer by occupation resident of ashika kulam uh, presented to our uh, hospital with the chief complaint of uh, extensive, extensive uh, that which involved the lower part of the chin neck region upper part of chest and right upper arm uh, since 8 months and inability to look upward since the past 6 uh, months so next uh, coming to the history of uh, presenting illness patient was apparently normal prior to the accident that is a fire crackers explosion at his workplace uh, later which he developed uh, burns that which involving the lower part of chin the neck region in uh, inherent and side of the neck upper part of the chest and uh, including the right upper arm and uh, so far uh, he underwent treatment at a primary health care center and later on for regular dressings and treatment he uh, opted for a local uh, he went uh, at a local treatment he took so uh, uh, later on uh, uh, there is a um, development of a gradual scarring that which involved the regions that is the lower part of the chin neck area chest and uh, uh, right upper arm and gradually he uh, found it difficult to look upwards since the past 6 months and uh, he had a history of weight loss of over 10 kg from the past 3 uh, months uh, post event and there is no history of any uh, strider sit in the sputum any airway uh, airway uh, uh, intervention but any respiratory distress there is no history of any uh, voice change at the time of uh, event and uh, so next uh, coming to the past history uh, there is no uh, uh, there is no suggestive history of any chronic illness like diabetes mellitus uh, hypertension uh, bronchial asthma epilepsy psychiatric diseases or any musculoskeletal disorders next uh, coming to the personal history he takes mixed diet is not an alcoholic no smoker uh, his um, appetite is normal bowel and bladder habits are normal sleep is uh, uh, disturbed occasionally because the patient could not uh, comfortably lie in uh, supine and in lateral position sometimes he found it difficult um, next uh, coming to the uh, family history it is not uh, relevant and treatment history uh, he underwent uh, regular uh, used to uh, uh, regular dressings for his uh, uh, injuries uh, um, and uh, he was kept on antibiotics and analgesics on and off and uh, next coming to the general examination next uh, coming to the general examination patient is uh, conscious covered over into the time place and person comfortably sitting with no signs of any respiratory distress and uh, thin build and moderately nourished the weight is 50 kg height corresponding to 165 cm corresponding to a bmi of 18.4 kg per meter square there are no signs of failure exercise cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy or pedal edema and veins are accessible next coming to the vitals uh, pulse rate is 84 beats per minute regular rhythm normal volume uh, no radio radial or radio femoral delay uh, condition of the vessel wall is normal next coming to the blood pressure is uh, 110 by 70 mm of mercury in right arm supine position saturation uh, 99% room air temperature uh, is at the prime 97.4 degree fahrenheit Uh, next coming to the airway exa- examination uh, there is a presence of thick fibrous strands that which is uh, present over involving the lower part of chin anterior and lateral aspects of neck upper chest just above the nipple line and the right upper arm uh, so uh, and oral cavity uh, patient has no loose or any missing teeth uh, next coming to the um, nose bilateral nostrils are patent and uh, normal uh next coming to the uh, mouth, mouth opening it is uh, corresponding to two finger breadth or three centimeter and modified malampati grading uh, which is corresponding to grade 3 and 
uh, due to the presence of the thick fire distance, so the sternomental distance and the thyromental distance could not be assessed. And um, next, uh, the upper lip bites, it is corresponding to grade three. And the temporomandibular joint, we could not be able to insinuate one finger in front of the tragus. And the, there is a restriction of the neck movements. So there is a limitation of less than uh, uh, extension. It is less than 65 degree. Uh, rotation uh, corresponding to 20 degree and the flexion corresponding to 50 degree. Uh, next, coming to the local examination uh, uh, on uh, inspection, there is a presence of thick uh, fibrous strands that which is present over, which is extending superiorly from the momentum. Inferiorly, it is extending uh, over the upper part of the chest region, just two centimeters above the nipple, nipple line. And uh, laterally, it is extending um, right side till the uh, right upper arm. Um, so, and uh, there is no um, overall healthy scar tissue is present. Uh, and uh, there is no presence of any active ulcers, sinuses, fistulas, or any angotic veins. And next, coming to the uh, palpation, there is no local rise of temperature. Uh, the, uh, the, the fibrous strands, the scarring is non tender, firm, and thickened. Sternal notch could not be palpated, and the thyroid cricoid and cricothyroid membrane uh, could not be palpated. Carotid pulsations are feebly felt. No other swellings are seen. Uh, so, um, so coming to the uh, finally coming to the summary, this a 35 year old uh, male patient by name Ramaro, who is a uh, daily wage laborer, came with the chief complaint of uh, extensive scarring and ability to look upwards for a period the duration of six to eight months. Uh, with the uh, um, limited mouth open, restricted mouth opening and uh, restricted uh, neck movements, which is a case of uh, probably a post-burn contracture, uh, which is scheduled under elective um, post-burn contracture release and grafting under general anesthesia. Uh, so um, later the, um, uh, investigations, uh, routine investigations like as you come in, say, um, CBC, RFT, LFT, um, blood sugar, uh, blood grouping was sent, and uh, um, specific investigations like uh, x ray, neck, AP, and uh, uh, Ramya, Ramya, sorry to interrupt. Eh? The examiners uh, probably they have to ask something, no? So let them ask about investigations and all. Eh? Okay. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. <coughs> Acha, Chitra. Yes, sir. So basically, how can you classify the bones? Uh, classification of the bones that can be done uh, uh, regarding the depth of the bones, sir. That is a uh, super uh, first degree burns, second degree burns, and third degree burns. First degree it involves uh, the epidermis, sir. Uh, second degree uh, there will be superficial and partial also. So there will be involvement of uh, epidermis and the, the dermis uh, levels. And then finally in the third degree, which is a full thickness burn. Uh, which involves uh, uh, along with the epidermis and sub uh, subcutaneous tissue and the muscle planes will be involved, sir. Now, how much uh, degree of burns uh, this patient is having? In this patient, uh, it involved the lower part of chin, neck area, chest, okay, and uh, so which corresponding to 15% of the uh, total burn surface area, sir. Okay. Is there any difference between the rule of nine uh, for adults and the pediatrics? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the rule of nine, it is uh, uh, it can be followed for pediatrics uh, uh, for adults. Sir, sorry. Uh, so there will be a, a coverage of eighteen percent head and neck, nine percent head and neck, eighteen percent chest, eighteen percent back. Both the upper limbs uh, corresponding to individually nine percent, um, and uh, both lower limbs corresponding to eighteen percent. Sir, this cannot be for. I mean, in uh, pediatrics, it varies, sir. Uh, there will be uh, for, uh, for the lower limbs, it will be 13.5% individually, and in the upper limbs, there will be 4.5% uh, this one, sir. And uh, uh, we can for all. Uh, Chitra, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you assess the burns? See, what, how do you optimize the patient for this, this patient for uh, general anesthesia? Pardon, sir. Once again, question, sir. How do you optimize this patient for gender uh, burn contracture release really under anesthesia? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Initially, we will uh, initially we will counsel the patient, sir, regarding the procedure uh, that which is uh, going to be taken. 
uh, we will uh, prepare and initially the uh, network oral orders will be given sir uh, six hours for solids and two hours for clear liquids and uh, uh, nebulization uh, nebulization uh, is ordered sir before uh, prior night and on the day of the surgery and on the day uh, and uh, uh, prior to the surgery uh, uh, patient will be uh, uh, prepared with the nas uh, nasal decongestion sir with the xylometrosolin drops and uh, nasal packing can be done sir with the lignoadrenaline when 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 a uh, preoperatively one hour before the surgery uh, we will be preparing the patient sir with nasal decongestion and uh, packing sir okay would you don't like to see investigation sir uh, how do you assess that facial lumen uh, tracheal lumen uh, we can uh, order uh, in uh, uh, in ct neck we can order sir so that we can know the perfect uh, tracheal uh, lumen diameter sir mm. it also delineates uh, what are the other structures also the ct ct scan neck yes, what it will uh, also any, tell you any deviation uh, of the trachea can be assessed sir in that any uh, any tracheal cartilages, what is the position of the tracheal cartilages, whether they are normal or not also you can... Yes, sir. Why, why these are all important? Because uh, during, uh, if, uh, if at all we plan for, uh, I mean, if there is a uh, plan for a blind nasal uh, uh, intubation, sir, it will be difficult if there is any tracheal deviation, sir. So it cannot be uh, uh, done if there is any tracheal deviation. Uh, what are the other investigations you would like to ask for this patient? Other investigations? Next, sir. AP and, uh, and uh, lateral view. What are the other investigations? What are? Hmm. And I'll... What are the other investigations which can facilitate? Uh, can be sent, sir. Uh, specific investigations like uh, X ray, neck, AP, and lateral, ultrasound, neck to see if any cysts are present. Uh, uh, <coughs> any infective cyst after the burns, any lock related sinuses are there or not? Can also be? Can also be? Evaluated by ultrasound scan. Is it not? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then, uh, uh, once you have optimized the patient and you will hand over to the, uh, you will take inside the theater of the patient, then the next part will come to Dr. Navya. How do you plan for this anesthesia for this patient? Is the preoperative preparation in proper in preoperative and postoperative management of both a patient posted for postborn contracture release. As already discussed, uh, the patient is first taken, uh, informed consent is taken, and patient is counseled, and uh, the procedure is clearly explained to the patient. And the prayer communication with the surgeon about the type of the surgery, the duration of the procedure, and uh, explained about the difficult area. Between the and preoperatively, the patient is prepared as a plan for awake nasal fibroptic intubation. Uh, nasal preparation with uh, decongestants like oxymetazoli, uh, drops one to two drops in each nostril, um, lignoidrin nebulization uh, day before the surgery, and uh, lignoidrin nasal packing one hour prior to the surgery in preoperative room is uh, uh, done. And the OT preparation, uh, normal OT preparation along with difficult airway trolley is uh, placed. And uh, patient is shifted to OT. Uh, after shifting the patient to OT, uh, ASC standard monitors like NABP, ECG, pulse oximeter connected, and baseline parameters are measured. Um, a, IV, uh, a large core IV cannula of 18 gauge is secured, and IV fluids are connected. Along with this, a senior anesthetist and a surgeon are explained, informed, and uh, asked to uh, be ready for any help if needed. And uh, before pre oxygenation, the lignoidry uh, nasal pack is removed from the both nostrils. And uh, lignoidry. How, uh, how do you assess the 
airway with the mask. Nasopharyngeal airway appropriate says uh, uh, after applying lignocaine jelly, uh, nasopharyngeal airway is passed into the nostrils. Uh, appropriate says nasopharyngeal airway is uh, used for the size estimation of uh, flexometallic tubes, uh, which will be used for intubation. And oh. it, it checks, uh, uh, along with it also checks the patency of the nasal airways. Oh. So in between, uh, if you have any problem, what to be done? Yeah, suddenly you have put the nasopharyngeal airway, you may yes. find a difficulty uh, in uh, oxygenating the patient, the saturations are coming down. Then, then uh, uh, high flow nasal uh, oxygen, uh, nasal cannula and oxygenation with 100% oxygen can be done, sir, hmm. to prevent the desaturation. And in another nose, sir, uh, two nostrils, one nose will keep nasopharyngeal airway and through another nose will plan for uh, Fibro optics. Okay. So, is there any role of any anterior neck procedures in this patient? Anterior neck procedure, interventional procedure. Uh, yes, uh, they, we can do stage, uh, uh, contracture release, sir, in uh, very difficult. No, no, for airway, airway, air, airway manipulation, is there any role of anterior neck no, procedure? Sir. Huh? No, sir. No, sir. Because yeah. of the contracture, we can't, uh, uh, there will be deformity of the neck, anterior neck, sir. So, anterior neck procedures can't be done in these patients, sir. No. What are the procedures left with this, in this patient for uh, securing the airway? Uh, other than uh, nasal fiber optic airway intubation, stage release of contracture, sir. Uh, oh. Along with, with uh, uh, cumulicent anesthesia, after release of the contracture, we can plan for uh, um, uh, intubation, direct intubation, sir. Intracranial intubation. In um, other other stage, second stage or third stage, you need to say. Second stage, yes. So, how do you do the tumulation tunnel? What is the difference between tumulation tunnel and field block? Is it there? Is there any possibility of field block in this patient? Uh, no, for, uh, neck contraction yes, release uh, under analgesia. Uh, no, sir. Uh, we will plan for tumescent anesthesia uh, in which uh, a uh, large dose of diluted uh, lignoid uh, epinephrine solution is injected into the site, sir. Mm. Uh, 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 which provides the analgesia and uh, during the stage removal, after the stage removal, uh, we can plan for the uh, intubation, sir. What are the other analgesic you use during the tumescent analgesia at the time of... Mm, uh, burn contraction release. IV drugs like ketamine can be given, sir. Which and dose? Uh, which dose? One, one which to two dose? mg. One to one two mg will MG do. Or anal analgesic dose. Ana yes, sir. Is it the one to two mg or analgesic dose? Analgesic dose. Sir. Uh, is, is there any role one of any uh, profile profile in this patient? IV propofol, um, is there any role? Uh, no, sir. In my patient, I have not done it with uh, any sedation, sir. I have yeah. continued with normal uh, uh, block airway, uh, normal airway intubation, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. If uh, the patient is hypertensive, what are the drugs? I will you? avoid ketamine, sir. No, sir. In uh, um, hypertensive patients, I'll avoid ketamine sir, and uh, go with if sedation is needed, low dose uh, propofol and uh, uh, fentanyl, analgesic fentanyl low dose uh, 0 0.5 to 1 micrograms per kg can be given, sir. For analgesia, sir. sir. Is there any role of any etomidate? Etomidate? Uh, etomidate. Uh, if it yeah. is a hemodynamically unstable patient, we can uh, go with uh, etomidate, sir. What, what is the role of inhalation anesthesia? Uh, inhalation, uh, if there is a, um, uh, during the process, if there is a stage uh, difficulty, so we can provide uh, uh, proceed with inhalation anesthesia, sir. Uh, with the uh, sevoflurane for rapid induction and rapid recovery, sir. So, you will do totally with uh, sevoflurane <laughs> induction or little bit supplementation? A uh, little bit supplementation, sir. To prevent any risk, any hypoxia, depression, respiratory depression. 
um go ahead um the patient is preoxygenated with uh, 100% oxygen for 5 minutes sir, after the removal of packing uh, nasal packing and pre medication for anti uh, anti cellulogic effect and uh, injection glycopyrrole 0.005 mg per kg iv is given sir uh, for anti anxiolysis injection midazolam 0.05 mg per kg iv for analgesia fentanyl uh, of low dose 0.5 to 1 microgram per kg uh, is given sir and uh, after uh, uh, again explaining to the patient, uh, uh, as already uh, fiber optic is selected based on the nasopharyngeal airway size, the uh, appropriate size nasopharyngeal um, flexometallic is passed through fiber optics uh, and uh, fiber optic is passed uh, into oral uh, uh, nasal passages up to Kerina and also spray as you go technique is followed. And lignocaine is sprayed along the glottic structures to prevent any airway reflexes. Sir. After uh, 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 entering up to uh, fiber optic is passed up to Kerena, sir. And uh, after uh, passing and confirmation, the flexometallic tube is uh, inserted into trachea and fiber optic is removed after five point auscultation. And um, after this, uh, induction agent uh, injection propofol is given uh, up to one to two uh, mg per kg and uh, pro uh, proceeded with muscle relaxant injection vecuronium 0.1 mg per kg sir next uh, the tube is, is the, if, if the bonds uh, liver bonds contract is less than one year old what is the requirement of muscle, uh, non depolarizing muscle relaxant and what is the role of depolarizing muscle relaxant Actually, uh, depolarizing muscle relaxants are usually avoided, sir. We'll go with non depolarizing muscle relaxant. And also, in these patients, uh, uh, there will be increased extra directional uh, receptors, sir. So, there will be delayed onset and also a short duration of action. So, increased dose of muscle relaxant should be given, sir, than normal doses. When the scolin uh, needs to be avoided, and when you can give. Uh, scolin less up to 20 foot 48 hours uh, with after burns we can give sir but after then uh, we will avoid up to two years sir. after two years uh, we can again give sir what is the difficulty if you give scolin sir if you give uh, scolin what happens uh, there will be prolonged depolarization phase sir and mm -hmm. uh, there will be increased uh, release of potassium, sir, causing hyperkalemia, mm. leading to myocardial arrhythmias, CS. Mm. What are the other conditions where scoline can't be used, contraindicated? In uh, malignant hyperthermia patients, sir. Uh, in bradycardia, patients uh, 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 heart rate uh, less than 60, bradycardia, sir. And also patients with uh, uh, history of neurological disorder with seizures history, sir. Um, increased the GARD, GAR, it also increases intragrastic pressures, sir. In I, <clears throat> yeah, what are the other conditions, sir? In ocular conditions? Glaucoma. Where? Glaucoma. And uh, intraocular pressure trials condition glaucoma, sir. Another yeah. condition will glaucoma. Okay. Okay. Then uh, okay. you have come to the place. How do you monitoring? How do you keep? Suppose if the burns are all over the body, where you okay. cannot access the vein, uh, monitoring, uh, you would like to monitor the patient intraoperatively or perioperatively. What is the mode? Like uh, ECG, blood pressure, all those things, how do you monitor? Intraarterial monitoring with the uh, um, securing an arterial line, uh, we'll go for arterial line monitoring, sir. What about And ECG? if there are ECG leads, we can't use uh, gel, gel, gel ones, sir. So we'll go for subcutaneous needles with uh, crocodile clamps, sir, so that uh, we can monitor ECG, sir. So now what is, uh, okay, you, you you have come to the stage where the everything is uh, going, uh, how do you assess the blood loss? Because one stage procedure, uh, there is a burn contraction release is there, lot of bleeding will be there. And uh, at the simultaneously, you also want to do graft, uh, that area, graft area also for taking graft, 
and uh, taking out the flap 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 and there also you have a lot of bleeding how do you assess the blood assessment blood loss um based on the mops or gauze pieces used sir uh, uh, according to gauze piece four into five size will uh, based on that uh, 10 ml and 10 to 10 size mops will calculate up to 100 ml uh, per inch sir and based on this estimated blood volume we will also plan for uh, a reserve uh, blood reserve sir it's more than estimated blood uh, uh, loss then we will start with the transfusions the transfusions what is the normal normal time and yes. operative will you assess pre operative hemoglobin assessment is mandatory for this patient yes sir yes sir yes. they are more prone to if the preoperative level yes. anemia is so, there uh, then if you say he, he wants to do skin grafting for a preoperative hemoglobin level of 8 grams what is your plan hello sir hello sir yeah if preoperative hemoglobin is suppose 8 8 grams are there and he wants to do yes, uh, grafting and uh, uh, at the one procedure only he wants to do what is your plan how do you plan the preoperative hemoglobin is 8 grams percentage coming for burns contracture relief with uh, grafting he wants to do grafting i think internet is having some problem at the local place are you hearing me navya yes sir uh, first uh, i'll go for uh, contracture relief sir and i'll start with blood transfusion sir hmm. and after that uh, split skin grafting is uh, continued sir after blood transfusion what is the fluid management you take in this patient is it important blood, blood. So more than 15 to sorry asking fluid management hello sir sorry is asking something i'm not sir yeah is a fluid management can you tell something about fluid management how the you parkland manage parkland formula usually resuscitation parkland formula is usually used sir in which 4 ml per kg per uh, total body surface area a burns is uh, uh, provided sir in which 50% is given within first eight hours sir and uh, remaining 50% in uh, uh, next uh, 16 hours is given sir and other formulas like modfed brooks these are also can be used sir in but in uh, pediatric patients if there is in pediatric patients along with this uh, 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 4 to 1 formula called uh, as a formula is used for exercise stations for maintenance so basically in the western countries uh, most of the uh, burns patients are mostly controlled with the fluid management only then comes the so half of the thing we settled with fluid management that importance go ahead uh, thank you sir uh, next question um after uh, securing the tube sir um, connected to ventilator mode one control and uh, duration of the procedure is uh, two hours sir and process is uneventful um maintenance is done with oxygen nitrous oxide co fluorine and uh, one dose of vecronium uh, mazelulaxant is given once sir and uh, the patient is uh, after uh, the procedure the patient is planned for on table extubation all the anesthetic gas are turned off and after checking for the spontaneous breathing if attend uh, reversal given with the all, all anesthetic gas that means oxygen also you will be turning no, off sir. no sir except the oxygen okay except oxygen sir. yes um reversal with neostigm 0.05 mg per kg and uh, glycopyrrolate 0.01 mg per kg is given start uh, given sir and uh, if after the patient is wide awake thorough suctioning is done and uh, tube is deflated and uh, extra patient is extubated sir uh, during extubation also a difficult airway trolley is kept ready in emergency uh, if uh, any resuscitation is required sir and uh, the patient after uh, extubation Uh, the, uh, before extubation, the patient is uh, uh, 100 pre-oxygenated with uh, 100% oxygen, and post-operatively the oxygen support is continued, sir. 
along with post op management pain management with uh, uh, i have done with injection um, paracetamol 15 to 20 mg per kg iv sir and uh, anti mt prophylaxis with uh, injection uh, onacitron 0.1 mg per kg is given sir and uh, after post operatively patient is monitored for hemodynamics uh, by connecting to acm monitors and uh, and the patient is maintained hemodynamically stable throughout the post operative procedures thank you what are the post operative complications uh, you can uh, anticipate um the uh, sudden desaturation may uh, just after extubation sudden desaturation we can anticipate sir and uh, we can anticipate for difficult uh, ventilation after the uh, procedure uh, extubation mm -hmm. so we will keep uh, we'll keep uh, airway exchange catheter ready sir if there is we anticipate any difficult uh, uh, extubation we will pass a um, airway exchange catheter and then we will extubate sir then we, if if there is a chance then we can reintubate easily sir Okay, post-operative shivering is there. Pain suspected. Yes, sir. Post-operative shivering is also temperature. It is very very important. Management. Yes, sir. Post-operative so intraoperative hypothermia is prevented using uh, uh, warmers, uh, warm fluid saline, and also uh, hum heated humidifier uh, air uh, air circuits are used to prevent hypothermia. <coughs> Okay. Okay. Any question from the audience? <coughs> very, very well managed and very well presented. Uh, you have answered practically. <coughs> I think so. All the questions very well done. Very well done. Thank you. Sir. uh if there are no questions there is a small question from my side uh to the both the presenters they did present very well uh, is there any role of rocuronium in such cases rocuronium in sugar medics sir rocuronium and sugar medics is there any role for rocuronium and sugar medics usage in such cases Yes, rocuronium can be given, sir. Okay. Um, and uh, if there is fibro difficulty during fiber optic intubation, uh, mm -hmm. and we are planning for, and if there is uh, given or uh, we have given rocuronium, then reversal we can do with uh, uh, sugar medex, sir. So immediate reversal is possible, sir. Then other way there is uh, no. Uh, right. Uh, instead of scolene, can we use rocuronium in such cases? Is one thing. Why do you prefer rocuronium over scolene in such cases? Is another thing. And what is the role of sugar medics? Is I wanted to ask you if probably you are not able to intubate this patient, we can have a rapid reversal with sugar medics. Not that yes. we can exactly. extubate. You see, with rocuronium, when you use, you can use neostigmine also. But only thing is, when you use sugar medic, it causes rapid reversal. If you are not able to intubate the patient, we are not able to secure the airway. We can awaken the patient. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, yes. but it was very well presented. I think all the PGs, most of the things. Uh, I can assure you, if you answer uh, all the Aditya, questions, Aditya, there is a question in the chat box. Oh. Please read. There is no question where I can see. Eight seconds, sir. No. Uh, I think it has been sent to you individually. Open chat I box, think. there is no question. Ah, okay, okay. Role of heparin and soda bicarb in burns. Role of heparin. Who is going to answer this? I'll give it to the speakers <laughs> first. I'll give it to the <laughs> presenters first and then to the professors. Anyone from the both speakers? Uh, uh, I just wanted to add something more to the question. Whoever has asked this question. Role of heparin and soda bicarbonate in burns case. Acute right. or sh acute or chronic? Yes, that is important. They didn't, they didn't mention. They didn't uh, mention. Please, that, person, person who has very asked, important. Person who has asked the question, can you please unmute yourself and frame the question in a better way? I request the person kindly unmute yourself. 
and please clarify the poor things. The question, they are not clear whether it's acute or chronic. Which type of burns okay. are in this case management? So I think we'll go, if since uh, role of heparin in acute burns, that's the question. It <laughs> they. gives the pain, sir. Yeah. It, uh, tell about the heparin. So liver functions, what happens? Yes, sir. It, in, uh, in burns, uh, it plays a role that it uh, relieves the pain, sir. And uh, it can also restore the blood flow. And uh, the in, uh, there will be uh, enhanced healing, enhanced healing, and the clotting factors. And it also plays a role in clotting factors and inflammatory mediators. So, so, uh, so actually, uh, the heparin actually it uh, aggravates the hypotension sometimes because of this. Uh, uh, usually, in past twenty four hours, uh, the patient suffered with uh, severe hypotension. So in past 24 hours, I don't think it will have any goal. And after 48 hours, there may be some role in some place. So in past 24 hours, you don't find anything. Everything is in, sometimes even in GIT also, you have curling ulcer, all hepatic system is there, almost in the shock state. And nothing is in the condition. So every system is almost in the uh, devastated condition that you want. Hypotension, shock, uh, curling ulcer, uh, CNS also, disorientation, pain, all those things will be. And depending on the type of burns also, is the first degree, second degree, or third degree, that, that also it makes difference. If it is third degree, the patient may not have any pain, but they have a severe hypotension. That is one more thing. I don't know what is the. Uh, I don't have much idea about preparing the acute stage. Uh, the one Anybody? Thing, uh, I request all the professors if anyone wants to add anything. So, okay. if bronchoscopy not available, can blind nature intubation and try it like. Uh, olden days. Olden I, days. Olden, olden nature days. ILD. Olden days, sir. Olden days. So. Yes, blindness and intubation can be always be there. Only thing is distortion of the trachea or deviation of the trachea, we don't know. And by the preoperative investigation of CT scan, we can know a little bit. And, and because of these thick bands of uh, scars in front of the neck, it is very difficult to manage the trachea by holding, the, uh, holding it. We may not be able to hold the trachea proper in this severe contraction birth. So manipulation from the external manipulation, it is difficult. If it goes, it is well and good. Blindness. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, uh, there is no manipulation uh, restriction is there. In this case. So uh, just to add on that, as Sir was speaking, uh, see, it depends on the setup you are planning. This is an anticipated difficult airway. If you are doing an awake blind nasal or things where you can reverse the patient without actually causing further harm, probably you can do it at your setup. But if you feel that you will not be able to do, you don't have short acting drugs or reversals or an experienced anesthetist to your help, then it's better to refer to a center to a place where there are actual bronchoscopy available because the medical legal laws nowadays are very simple and clear that if you do not have the uh, a particular facility available, then probably you should uh, try to defer this case at your setup and schedule it at a place where it's available. And just to add one more thing on the heparin in acute burns, first three to four days, actually there is no role of heparin as such in any burns case because there are a lot of raw surfaces available which will cause further oozing and might lead a patient to land up into DIC. So probably in the first uh, couple of days, what we actually need to concentrate is on adequate hydration and pain relief for the patient which will, to a certain extent, not to a complete extent, certain extent in a significant way will reduce the chances of any thrombosis at a particular level. So if there are no more questions, any more questions that are available or any seniors professors who want to add anything? Uh, so if there are no questions, I would like to thank both the speakers as well as professors for sharing their experiences and wiseness over the case presentation. The basic idea here is to make a postgraduate more confident in approaching an exam mm -hmm. and trying to make him prepare for a different set of questions 
in all possible ways to be covered so that we have a, a better and a sound anesthesiologist working around the clock. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to thank all and I would like to hand over the things to Dr. Ram Krishna sir. Congratulations, Ramya and Navya. Very well presented. And mm -hmm. uh, you answered all the almost all questions. And I thank uh, Dr. Jai Shankar Jana sir with a short, uh, you know, like uh, uh, notice he came and uh, spoke on a very good topic. And I also thank Dr. Virasham sir and Dr. Hemnath Babu sir to join today's webinar as examiners. Thank you, uh, I think uh, it is useful Hi. for all the postgraduates and also practitioners, Jai Shankar sir topic. Um, thank you all. So and, anything to add, sir, Viresham, sir? Yeah, I would like to add, uh, I I thank you, ISA Telangana webinar teaching program members and committee members, academic committee members on behalf of GEMS, Sri uh, and on behalf of Dr. Hemnath Babu also and my post Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank uh, you, especially Mm. Especially having you today as examiner variation, sir, it will be helpful for Telangana PGs because you will be all-rounder examiner in Telangana, <laughs> almost all <laughs> <medical colleges. laughs> you know? this is, this So is they will know your questioning pattern. <laughs> Partial match fixing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Jai, Thank sir. You. And uh, Kiran, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, Kiran sir. Thank you all. Thank Thanks. you, Kiran sir. Thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you for sir. giving this opportunity, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thanks. Thanks to all. Thanks, Ramya. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Well done. Well done. Congratulations, sir. Very well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. I am coming. Hmm.